Allah says, Ma not kadaba. It lied. Al fuadu the heart. The heart did not lie about what ma ra'a that which it saw. Because here, what is being mentioned? That the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel in his original form. Correct? And when was this? This was twice. As the Prophet ﷺ himself explained, we will learn about that in a hadith that I will mention later on. The first time when the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel in his original form, that is described in these verses. Alright? And we learn about that in a hadith also. The fourth hadith in Bukhari, we learned the Prophet ﷺ said that while I was walking, all of a sudden I heard a voice from the sky. I looked up and saw the same angel who had visited me at the cave of Hira, sitting on a chair between the sky and the earth. Meaning, he covered the entire horizon. Wherever the Prophet ﷺ saw, what would he see? Jibreel in front of him. So this vision of Jibreel, Allah says, مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى The Prophet ﷺ's heart did not lie about it. What the eyes saw, what the eyes sensed, the heart correctly perceived. Basically there was no contradiction or discrepancy between sensation and perception. You see, sensation is what? Your eyes sense something. Your ears sense a sound. Right? Like for example, you're walking and you feel like somebody called you out. Right? You sense something. You sense a sound. And then when you look back, there's absolutely nobody. Right? So you realize that you were probably just imagining things. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ's heart did not lie. What does it mean? That he understood in his mind that, oh, this is an angel, 600 wings, all right, covering the entire horizon, that is real. What he saw was real. What he understood was correct. And when Jibreel conveyed the Quran to him, what the Prophet ﷺ heard and understood and learned, he learned it with perfection, without any error. ما كذب الفؤاد ما رأى Allah says, a would fa then tumarunahu you dispute with him o oh you people would you dispute with him sallallahu alayhi wasallam ala about ma yara what he sees meaning what he saw tumarunahu imtira is to dispute about something that you have doubt about because if you accepted it if you had no doubt about it, you wouldn't argue about it. You're arguing about it because you don't want to believe in it. You're not sure about it. So you're not convinced. Allah says, would you argue with him, would you dispute with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over what he saw himself? Meaning he saw it. He's not making it up. This is not a lie. He has never uttered a lie before. Now you accuse him of lying? How could he be lying? He actually saw Jibreel. And it's not the only time when he saw Jibreel. وَلَقَدْ And certainly, رَآهُ He saw him نَزْلَةً In a descent, أُخْرَى Another. نَزْلَةً From نَزَلَةً To come down. أُخْرَى Another time. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel at another time also. At another occasion also. And this was when? At the journey of Isra and Mi'raj. So from these verses, what do we learn? The Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel twice in his original form. In a hadith in Musnad Ahmad, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said about the ayah, ma kathab al fu'adu ma ra'a, that the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel in a garment of silk, filling the entire space between the sky and the earth. He saw him with his own eyes. Now some have said, that these verses are not referring to Angel Jibreel, rather they're referring to Allah. So they said that the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah the Exalted on the Mi'raj journey. But this is not correct. Why? Because there is a hadith in Muslim in which we learn 
that once Aisha radiallahu anha, she said to Masruq, that whoever, that there are three things, and if anyone affirms even one of them, then he is fabricating the greatest lie about Allah. So Masruq said, what are they? And she said, that whoever says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw his Lord has fabricated a lie about Allah. So Masruq, he said, I was sitting at that time, I got up, I sat up straight and I asked that what about the ayah, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى Or this ayah that وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى What about these verses? Because Masruq understood that these verses were referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he quoted some other verses also. And Aisha radiallahu anha said that I was the first person from this ummah to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about this. And he said that that was Jibreel. That was who? Jibreel. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explained that over here, what I saw, who I saw was Jibreel. I had never seen him in his original form in which he was created except on these two occasions. Alright? These two occasions. The first one at the beginning of Revelation. And the second one in the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. And the Prophet wasallam said, I saw him descending from the heaven and filling the space from the sky to the earth with the greatness of his bodily structure. So this is Hadith and Muslim. So these verses are referring to Jibreel. That how the Prophet wasallam saw Jibreel. In Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 103, Allah says, لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارِ Vision cannot, cannot perceive him. Remember Musa a.s. wanted to see Allah, and Allah told him that you cannot. Isn't it? When the Prophet a.s. was asked if he saw Allah the Exalted, he said, Noor, that Allah is Noor. How can I see him? Meaning my eyes don't have the capacity. My human body, physical body right now, does not have the capacity. We don't have it. This is a reward, this is a ladha that Allah has kept reserved for when? For the hereafter. In Surah Al-Shura, Ayah 51, that وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَن يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ That Allah would not speak to a man except through revelation or from behind a veil. From behind a veil. Right? So here these verses are referring to who? To who? Jibreel. That how the Prophet ﷺ was made to see Jibreel. Where was this? The first occasion, as I mentioned, at the beginning of Revelation. The second occasion was when? In the journey of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. Right? Allah says, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى When was this? Where was this? عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى Inda near Sidra, tree, lot tree. Which lot tree? Al-Muntaha, of the utmost boundary. That is the place where the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel the second time. Near Sidra al-Muntaha. Sidra, seen Dalra, Sidr is a certain type of a tree, which is known as hackberry or honeyberry or European nettle or lot tree. Right? Most common is lot tree. And the lot tree is well known for its beauty. It's huge. Its leaves are big. It's a lush, beautiful tree with sweet berries and fragrant leaves. Its leaves are fragrant. And in fact, they're used for mixing with water for the purpose of ghusl. All right? And here, this sidra is not a sidra somewhere on this earth. Rather, this is a sidra where? At al-muntaha. Muntaha from the root letters? Root letters? Nunha, ya. Nahi. What does nahi mean? To stop. Muntaha means the place where things stop. So it is the boundary. The boundary. Meaning that Boundary beyond which the creation cannot go. Even Jibreel cannot go. If you remember about the journey of Mi'raj, remember there came a point where Jibreel told the Prophet ﷺ, I cannot go beyond this point. If I were to go, my wings would burn. Alright? 
So muntaha. Now sidrat al muntaha, this is a tree located where? In the sixth and seventh heaven. How is that so? We learn in some ahadith that it is in the sixth heaven. In other ahadith in the seventh heaven. So what is understood is that its roots are where? In the sixth heaven. And it's so huge that it goes all the way up to the seventh heaven. All right? And remember, when we talk about matters of the unseen, matters related to al ulawi the world that is above us. One is alam sufali the lower level where we are in this world, what we see. Right? And then there are matters which are beyond us, a world that exists beyond us. Then, remember the explanation of the companions, that it's only the words which resemble, not the characteristics. So, don't think about, oh, how can a tree grow up in the sky? No. This is a different type of a tree. How that sky is, we don't even know. Right? In fact, we see that on each sky, when the Prophet ﷺ went, who did he meet? Different prophets. So when you think of the sky, don't think of the blue sky. Alright, these are matters of the unseen. The description of this low tree, we learn from hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, I was taken to Sidratul Muntaha whose leaves were huge. Huge. And he gave a description as huge as elephant ears maybe. Elephant ears. Elephant ears are massive. So the leaves of this tree, they were huge. And its fruit was also huge. And it was covered with something, as Allah says, إِذْ يَغْشَ سِدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَ In another hadith we learned that Abdullah radiallahu anhu said that when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa was taken on the night journey, he came to Sidratul Muntaha, which is in the sixth heaven, meaning its roots are in the sixth heaven. That is where everything that comes up from below ends. Why is it called Muntaha? Because this is where everything that goes up from the earth stops. Its limit. Alright? It cannot go beyond that. Allah says that Indaha, near it, meaning near Sidratul Muntaha, is Jannatul Ma'wa. Is Jannah the garden of Al Ma'wa? of the eternal refuge, meaning the abode of eternity, the home of eternity, the Jannah where all delights and bliss is gathered. Because you see how Jannah is described as its location is where? Near Sidratul Muntaha. Right? Sidratul Muntaha. Muntaha, the point beyond which the creation cannot go. Correct? So Jannah is also at that location, near that location. What does it mean then? What does this teach us about Jannah? That Jannah is a place where all wishes and desires and imagination and cravings reach their limit. Meaning there is, as we learn in the Quran, that waladayna mazid. People in Jannah will be asked, desire, wish, wish for something. They will say, what can we wish for when we've been given everything? Right? So it's the maximum extent of human desire, of human imagination, of human capacity to enjoy. That is contained where? That will be fulfilled where? In Jannah. Because it is near the muntaha, the limit of the creation. So indaha jannatul ma'wa. Idh when, now Allah describes the tree, Idh yagsha sidra. Idh when, when the Prophet ﷺ was there and he saw Jibreel, he also saw many amazing things. Yagsha, it covered. A sidrata, the tree, the low tree. What covered the low tree? Ma yagsha. That which covered it. Meaning it's indescribable. None knows it's true description except Allah. What is that? There are no words to describe what covered the Lot tree. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, in one narration it is reported that he said it was gold moths. Something of gold. 
the Prophet ﷺ, in his words, he said that the tree underwent such a change that none amongst the creation has the power to praise its beauty. The tree underwent such change, meaning it wasn't just one solid color, rather it was changing, and it was such a change that I cannot explain it. No human being, no creation has the capacity to praise its beauty. The colors were beyond human ability to explain. إِذْ يَغْشَ سِدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَ In another hadith we learned the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel took me until we reached Sidratul Muntaha, which was shrouded in colors. What colors? Indescribable. This is a hadith in Bukhari. Now if you think about it, this is where the Prophet ﷺ was taken in order to receive a command from Allah a command that was direct. And what command was that? It was regarding prayer, salah. Isn't it so? If you think about it, this is where Allah spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember, when Allah spoke to Musa alayhi salam, was there a tree over there too? Yeah? A tree that was perhaps covered in fire, but a fire that was not consuming the tree. Right? Something amazing, something indescribable. And here also, the Sidra was covered in indescribable colors. Something amazing is happening. Something beyond human understanding even. But Allah praises His Messenger that مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى Even though the Prophet ﷺ was witnessing something, that he could not fully comprehend, he could not even fully explain later, yet his eyes did not deviate, nor did they transgress. He was so focused. Can you imagine being at a place where there's so many, you know, colors that are changing, changing colors or changing lighting? What would happen to us? What would happen? We would forget the work that we were supposed to do, and we'd be just staring at the things. Isn't it? We just be looking around. We get distracted so quickly, so easily by the silliest of things. This is something amazing. The Prophet ﷺ is above in the heavens. And Allah says, مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى زَاغَ زَاغَ from زَيغ زَيَ غَيْن And زَيغ is to deviate, to go right or left instead of going straight. Now, when you're looking at something that you're reading or you're looking at the work that you're doing, you're supposed to be looking at it. If you look right, you're distracted. If you look left, again, you're not looking at your work. Right? So, this is not appropriate. It means that you're not focused. Allah says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma zaag al-basaru. His vision did not deviate. It did not go right. It did not go left. He did not look to the right. He did not look to the left. وَمَا طَغَى طَغَى طُغْيَان is to what? To overstep the bounds. To overstep the bounds. Right? So مَا طَغَى meaning he did not look beyond what he was supposed to look at. Because sometimes the book is in front of us. We're not looking right or left, but we're looking up or straight. Get it? مَا طَغَى Allah is praising the Prophet ﷺ over here. That how focused he was on taking what Allah was giving him. He was so focused on taking in what Allah was giving him. And by this he was observing ultimate adab, respect, with full concentration. This is receiving and taking when we're fully focused. The reason why we don't learn after spending hours and hours listening and reading and writing is because we're not focused. Either there is zayl or there is tuliyan. Either we're looking right or left or we are looking at where we're not supposed to. The Prophet ﷺ was not distracted at all. He controlled his vision. And that is the first thing we must control if we want to get somewhere in life. Because you see, Whatever the eyes admire, the heart desires. Isn't it? If you're looking at things, you'll never be satisfied with what you have. Correct? And if you are constantly looking around, you won't know where to fix your eyes on. You won't know what to focus on. 
you're not going to be able to choose. So look at what's in front of you. Look at what Allah has given you. And then you will see what's amazing. As over here, Allah says, مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam controlled his vision. And then he saw what was amazing. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Then he certainly saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. Our fear is, we fear that if I'm only going to look at, for example, the book in front of me, or if I'm just going to focus on the work that I am doing, then I'm going to miss out. I'm going to miss out on other things that are going on in the world. But the thing is that when you focus on your work and you do it well, you do it properly, then you see things that you cannot see without that knowledge and ability. Then you gain understanding that you cannot develop, that you cannot have without that knowledge. You know, my mother, when she was doing her studies, she was with my father, both of them, they were doing their PhD in Glasgow, in the UK. And I was born at that time, all right? And my parents, they would drive all the way to a different city to study with a sheikh. And every time they would go, a group of students would go together. And my mother, what would happen with her is that, obviously, me as a baby, I would start crying. So she would have to get up and leave the halaqa and go and, you know, put me to sleep or whatnot. And by that, she would miss out on her lesson. And... Her sheikh, he recognized her potential and her ability to study. And he would encourage her to keep studying. Right? And so many times his wife would, would actually babysit me so that my mother could study. And there came a point where her sheikh told her that if you want to study, you're not allowed to conduct any halaqas. You can't teach. And my mother was a girl who, when she went to college, it wasn't the condition that she would teach somebody the Qur'an. So even in the bus, in the car, or at school, in university, she would be teaching other people the Qur'an. This was a part of her life. And her sheikh told her, you cannot do that. You're not allowed to do that until you're done your studies. And she said, no, 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 I have to do it. He said, no, you cannot do it. He forbade her. You want to study, you give it your 100%. You got to focus and you have to let go of something. And then he eventually told her to send me away. To my grandparents. And alhamdulillah, that was an option that was there. And so I stayed with my grandparents for a couple of years until my parents returned. And alhamdulillah, I got the love of grandparents and uncles, spoiled child 100%. All right. And uh, my parents, on the other hand, they got to study. But as a woman, I think of it, how difficult it must be for her to make that decision. You know, thinking about the time when she had to fly all the way to a different country and leave her nursing baby and then go away without the baby it must be very difficult. Right? But if we want to get somewhere in life, there is a required level of sacrifice and we better get used to it. Sometimes that sacrifice is putting your phone on silent. But if you cannot do that, then tell me, when will you study? How and when? When can you do it? If we don't have this much control over ourselves that we cannot put our phones away, when are we going to study? When are we going to take? When are we going to receive? When Jibreel came to give the Qur'an to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he didn't sit on his right, he didn't sit on his left, he didn't sit two meters away. He came and sat right in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Direct connection. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went on Mi'raj, he didn't look right, he didn't look left, he didn't look up or down. He was focused on what he was to take in. مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى And if we don't develop this quality within ourselves, ultimate focus, then we cannot take, we cannot receive. In order to receive, we have to open our hands. And if our hands, if our hearts are occupied with other things, we cannot receive. We cannot. مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى And when he was such, then Allah did not deprive him. لَقَدْ رَآهُ 
Certainly the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa saw min ayati rabbihi from the signs of his Lord. Which signs? Al-Kubra, the greatest ones. Al-Kubra, feminine of the word Akbar. Greatest signs. And when was this? At the journey of Isra and Mi'raj. Allah showed him many ayat. As mentioned in Surah Al-Isra, the first ayah, Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi layla min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina. There were many ayat, many great ayat that Allah showed him up in the heavens. Firstly, Jibreel. The Prophet sallallahu was made to see Jibreel. Not just Jibreel, but even Jannah and Hellfire. Punishments that were being given to different people. Even different nations of the Prophets, even the Kawthar. In a hadith we learned the Prophet ﷺ said that while I was walking in paradise on the night of Mi'raj, I saw a river. And he described that river in beautiful terms. And he said, I asked Jibreel, what is this? And he said, this is Al-Kawthar which your Lord has given you. This is Al-Kawthar which your Lord has given you. When you focus on your Lord, when you focus on your purpose, yes, you are giving up certain things. But remember, your Lord is not going to deprive you. He's not going to leave you empty-handed. He's going to give you what you could not get yourself. But you must be willing to let go of certain things. The Prophet ﷺ also described that on the night of journey, on the night of Isra wal Mi'raj, while he was up in the heavens, he said, I smelled a beautiful fragrance. And so I asked, O oh, Jibreel, what is this fragrance? And he said, this is the fragrance of the mashiqa of Fir'aun's daughter. Who's that? Hairdresser. The hairdresser of Fir'aun's daughter and her children. And the Prophet ﷺ said, who was she? What is her story? And Jibreel told him that one day this lady was combing the hair of Fir'aun's daughter when the comb fell from her hand, and she said, Bismillah, as she picked it up. And Fir'aun's daughter said, Do you mean to mention my father's name? Who's Allah? And so that lady, the hairdresser, she said, No, I mean the Lord of Fir'aun and my Lord. And so the daughter of Fir'aun said, I will tell my father. And so she went and told him. And the mashita, the hairdresser, she said, Go ahead. And she didn't hesitate. And basically Fir'aun, he called her, summoned her, and asked her that, Do you have a Lord besides me? She said, Of course, it is Allah who is my Lord and your Lord. And Fir'aun ordered that a pot of copper be heated up. And it was. And he ordered that her children be thrown into it one by one before her. And finally her infant nursing baby. And then eventually even she was thrown in. So when the Prophet ﷺ was up in the heavens, he was made to smell the beautiful fragrance of this lady and her children. That those who sacrifice in the way of Allah, those who remain firm and steadfast, then Allah does not let them go waste. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى In another hadith we learned when the Prophet ﷺ was taken on the night journey, he said that he passed by a prophet. And he saw some prophets. Some prophets were such that with them were a few people. Meaning one prophet had just a few people with him. And then there was another prophet with whom was a group of people. And another prophet with whom was a bigger group or a smaller group. And then there were, there were prophets who had nobody with them. Until he passed by a prophet who had a large group of people with him. Biggest group possible that, that he had seen so far. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I asked Jibreel, who is this Prophet? And he was told, this is Musa and his people. And then Jibreel told him, raise your head and look. So when the Prophet ﷺ saw, looked, he raised his head and saw, he said that he saw a large multitude that covered the horizon from one side to the other. And it was said that this is your Ummah. You think that the Ummah of Musa is huge? Your Ummah is bigger. And 70,000 of these people shall enter Jannah without any hisab. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Somebody had raised their hands.
I was thinking about the ayah focusing, you know, uh, once I was listening to Mishti Nain, he said, if you lower your gaze, he said, like, every time if you lower your gaze, whether it was just physically, like, walking or in, like, uh, media or uh, whatever, entertainment, if you lower your gaze, he said, you can focus in your salah. Because if you don't lower your gaze, he said, you're going to remember everything you watch. So he's right. Subhanallah, when I try, I feel like my focus in the salah better. But sometimes we go here and there. So especially the, the like WhatsApp or whatever, that it take attention of, uh, yes. yes. If you think about it, we're constantly being bombarded with information. Isn't it? I mean, our brains are being, you could say, summoned by so many things constantly all the time that it's as if the poor brain doesn't get any rest ever. Right? I mean, if you think about it, if you look at something, there comes a point where after a few moments you get bored of it and then you look away. Correct? But the way filming is done is that every few seconds, what's going on? The angle is shifting, it's changing, it's moving. Why? So that it's difficult for you to look away. Isn't it? So we are constantly being bombarded with information, with so much stuff that it's difficult for our brains to focus on something. And something that requires a lot of focus is what? Salah. So we have to train ourselves to look away, to not let our eyes go right or left or up or beyond, rather focus on what we're supposed to look at or lower our gazes at times when necessary in order to develop the ability to concentrate. We must do that. Yes. This morning I was listening to Akhida Masatiya by Ustaza and I was listening about how Ibn Taymiyyah at a very young age he refused to go with his family on a picnic, choosing to stay at home. And then he lived like 60 something years but what he achieved in his lifetime, he even did not want to marry so he could give all to yeah. his, you know, to the deen and to the study of the Quran and the tafsir, you know, an amazing uh, life that we can take lessons from. Very true. That it is said that Ibn Taymiyyah, once his family was going somewhere out for the day, and he requested to stay back. So in the evening, when his father returned, he asked him, what did you do? He said that I learned this book, I memorized it. So his father tested him. And he had actually managed to memorize a whole book. And he said, don't tell anybody. Because he was afraid that his son would get the evil eye. Right? Any, to get somewhere, you have to sacrifice. To learn something, to develop a skill, you have to sacrifice. And if, without sacrifices, and don't look at sacrifice as, oh, poor me. Don't pity yourself. Think of it as an investment. That I am letting go of this. Why? To invest in myself. To improve myself. To grow myself. To develop myself. Yes. Go ahead. It wasn't only uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, but lots of people in the past would do things like that. For example, um, Imam Nawi, in which at a young age, he wouldn't play with anybody. He wouldn't play. Some scholars would see him and say that he, around the age of 10 or younger, he would not play with the kids who just read a book. I also thought about when you mentioned the hadith of the Prophet, and he said when he seen a Muntaha, and he said that, there's no way you can describe it, and its beauty is something that can't even be praised. I thought, if that is the creation of Allah, imagine Allah Himself, even though He's above all examples. And we try to describe how His hand is, how his, this is, uh, and we can't. His beauty is above all examples. Yes. That if the creation is so beautiful, then how great must be the Creator? Assalamu alaikum. And uh, Thursday, one of uh, my, stu- my students in memorization of the Quran, she finished Quran, alhamdulillah, mashallah. So uh, what happened as a class, we get her a gift, bookmark. And then uh, we give her and she was happy and she put the bookmark under her uh, chair. She didn't open it, she didn't know what is it. And then while she's just sitting and she, and she saw another girl, she had the bookmark. And she said, oh, it's so beautiful, mashallah. I like the bookmark. Then I tell her, why don't open your gift? When she opened her gift, she was so happy. And I was wondering, who knows what she like? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because she sacrificed for Allah, Allah gives her what she wants. This so is how, just a bookmark. Imagine yes. that. Focused on her lesson, that yes, I got a gift, but I will look at it later. 
and she puts it away, focused on her lesson, and she gets exactly what she liked.